Would you please welcome Mr. Alan White. Thank you. So my name's Alan White, uh, and uh, I'm going to talk about the Coptal Estate in the 19th century, uh, and I'm going to give a brief glimpse of those who made it work. Um, so I, uh, Gary's asked me to say a bit about myself first. So uh, I'm a retired university academic. Um, I used to work at the University of East London, if you're familiar with that, uh, and then at uh, Anglia Ruskin University um, in Chelmsford and Cambridge. Uh, I was a lecturer in sociology, social policy, um, um, a long time ago. For about the last 20 years that I was working, I kind of um, climbed up the greasy pole of management and uh, was the director of the graduate school at UEL and then at um, Angla Ruskin, Angla Ruskin University. Um, uh, so that's what I did when I worked. Well, I, I did other things before that. If any of you are old enough to remember a camping sports and fishing tackle shop, which used to be on the corner opposite Chingford Station. Does anybody here remember that? Right, I used to be the manager of that shop uh, back in the 1970s um, in a different life. Um, I come from a working class family um, in the East End of London and um, I left school with one O level and I got into education late. Um, so uh, that's my kind of class background. Um, I'm a committee member of Chingford Historical Society um, and I have links with Copt Hall in that I have run uh, study days for them um, on family history um, because one of the things that I have done for the last 30 years is research my family tree and I do also work for clients to look at their family tree for them. Um, so I ran a study day for Coctoral a couple of weeks ago on that. And indeed, uh, we have a link, that is to say, Chingford Historical Society has a link in that we, we um, gave them a book um, a couple of months ago, which is going to be, Coptal are opening a um, study library um, up on the third floor of the hall. And um, the book that we gave them will have pride of place in the library um, and uh, I'm also a committee member of uh, Waltham Forest History Society, Family History Society. Um, so uh, and then sometimes I sleep at night. Um, <laughs> so that's that's about me. Um, so you know, if I do that Good. Okay, so I just want to, just in case people don't know where Copt Hall is. So Copt Hall is um, on the outskirts of Epping. This is, a, as it says, an 1896 Ordnance Survey map. Uh, and um, by the way, I do tend to move around a bit. I apologise to those of you that are online. Um, it's, um, it's much harder to hit a moving target. Um, <laughs> so you can see that Copt Hall, uh, the estate, um, is... Um, over here. This is the park around the hall and Epping is over there. So it's kind of a couple of miles to the uh, southwest um, of Epping. Um, when I first saw Copt Hall, it looked like that. Uh, and many of you may remember Copt Hall when it was just a ruin. Um, that, um, that photo dates from about 1975. Uh, perhaps like me, you used to go in even though you weren't supposed to and explore. Yeah, we all used to do that. Um, go, go and explore the ruins and um, in autumn go into the overgrown garden and pick the blackberries. Um, certainly I used to. Um, and uh, I'll talk in a bit about how it got into that state. Um, so 1993, the Copt Hall Trust was established. Uh, and in 1995, it bought the hall uh, and the gardens and started the project of restoration of the hall. It is like, I always think it's like a kind of a scenario for an Ealing Studios film. You get this bunch of dedicated people who say, hey, let's buy 
a shell that's been standing open to the elements for 60 or 70 years with no roof, no floors, and let's bring it back to life. Let's put the roof back on, let's put the floors back in, let's rebuild it. It's, it is a very, I think, English uh, idea to take on something like that. Um, so the Copshall Trust bought it in 1995 for a very small amount um, and um, are in the process of um, restoring the hall back to how it looked in about the 1870s. Um, that's a more recent view. You can see it's got a roof on, it's got glass in the windows and the grounds are beginning to be brought back to life. I mean, you know, it's a terrible story about some parts of Cocktail, you may or may not know. It had, it, had, it had a winter garden, which survived, I think, until the late 1960s or early 1970s. And then the army blew it up for practice. Uh, uh, and they're now in the process of trying to bring it back together. They're, and they're, they're also trying to bring all the bits, all, all the furniture, the garden and household furniture that was sold off. Um, in the 50s and the 60s, they're trying to bring it all, all back and restore it. Um, so one day about four years ago, I had a thought, and I, this talk is in part, uh, is meant to be a lesson about not having thoughts or not thoughts like this. Because I thought, why not write a history of Cox Hall estate, not, not just the hall itself, the Cocktail estate from the vantage point of those who made it work. Um, and the reason I did that, I just want to illustrate why I decided, why I thought it would be a good idea. So this is um, a, an extremely good book. It's called Nine Centuries at Cocktail, and it's written by Sylvia Keith. And on page 55, she's talking about one of the occupants of the hall. <clears throat> And she says, the eldest, Julia, married the on Anthony John Ashley, a barrister. And she lived at Copt Hall until two years after her husband's death. In the census of 1861, they were at home and living in the house were listed the Ashleys, their footman, the cook, two housemaids, a kitchen maid, an errand boy, the gardener with his wife, and three children and the groom and his wife, none of whom apparently had names. Um, so I thought, you know, why do we know so much about the people who owned it and lived in it? And why do we know so little about the people that made the whole place work? And I thought it would be fun <laughs> to, um, to write something for Cocktail um, about that not a huge book, just a slim volume. And um, I went up to Cocktail and met with Alan Cox, who's the chair of the trust and who's the man who's driven all the restoration work forward. Um, and we agreed that I would do that. Well, then, you know, there was COVID and, and then other things got in the way. This was all about four years ago. Um, so it's not got very far. And that's part of the reason. But the other part of the reason is it's very hard to write about people who leave very little public trace. Because the people that owned Cocktail, their story is written all over the place. The people who made the whole work, their story isn't really written anywhere. Um, if they leave any trace at all, it is in the local newspapers and that's normally because they've had a run-in with the law or it's in the census returns but all the census tells you is somebody's name roughly where they were born roughly when they were born and their occupation which is a bit dry and reading a book that just says there was this and then there was that and then there was the other you know is not an interesting read you need a story to be engaged um, so this is work in progress, and tonight is in part me asking you for any ideas you've got as to how you can write a story about people who leave very little traces, and where the traces that they do leave tend to be about their engagements with the law, which might make you think that they were of a criminal class. Personally, I don't think that's the case. 
these are people who were trying to survive in extremely hard times. And, and if they went onto somebody's land to catch a rabbit, well, okay, it was against the law, but if you need to feed your family, perhaps you see things from a slightly different point of view. Um, yeah, so um, I will, I'm going to talk for probably about another 25 minutes, and then there'll be some time for you to ask any questions or offer me any ideas you have as to how this can be done. Um, some issues before I start. Most of the examples that I'm going to give are men. Then, as now, men tend to figure more than women do, but women's work is equally as important as men's. Um, what are the sources? Well, as I've said, it's mainly the census returns and newspapers, and I've sort of indicated some of the limitations that they have. When I say the people who made the estate work, who do I mean? Well, I think there's three groups. There's the tenants of the farms, that's one group. There's the second group is those that the tenants of the farms employ. And the third group are those who the tenants employ, employ a kind of subcontracting, which went on. And the sources for those groups get harder to find as you go down. There's a reasonable amount about the tenants of the farms, not so much about those they employ and very little about those people who are employed by the people who are employed by the tenants of the farms. I will be using the 81 cents, 1871 census a lot as I go through, which is, I guess, kind of meant as a health warning. I will be throwing sort of names and dates at you. I'll, I'll try to make it as straightforward as I can, though. Um, so let's just get some background stuff on Cocktail out of the way first. The core of the hall, that, that bit that you're looking at there, um, dates from the early 1750s uh, when a guy called John Conyers Sr. he decided to pull down the old hall, a Tudor hall, which um, was um, over to the northeast of where the current hall is, uh, and to build a new one because like lots of people who have lots of money, uh, he wanted to show that he was up to fashion. Um, in 1869, the hall and the estate were sold by a granddaughter of that John Conyers senior to a man called George Wythes, who had made his money as an engineer from railways and canals. Wythes' grandson, Ernest James Wythes, uh, he enlarged and remodeled the hall in the late 19th century. The central part of the hall, the bit you're looking at there, the bit that we used to scamper around, was gutted by a fire in the morning of Sunday, the 5th of May, 1917. And the Wythes family moved out to um, a property called the Wood House, which is on the Copt Hall estate, and where Rod Stewart lived for 20 years. Just thought I'd drop that in. Uh, but the Wythes moved out never to return because they planned to rebuild the hall, and in the end, they decided not to. The estate, however, continued to exist. Now this map, which actually dates from the 1940s, and which was, this copy was given to me by Alan Cox, and is probably from the state office. Um, but I'm showing it to you to give you a sense of, of, of the vast size of the Copt Hall estate when it was at its height. And I have written on this map the names of some of the farms, which hopefully you may be able to see. So there's New Farm, there's Berry Farm, um, there is Wintry Park, which is over on the right hand side, which I'll be talking about in a moment. Um, so the estate at its height was extremely uh, large. This is so, as I've said, the Copt Hall estate was sold in 1869, and this is being, I've extracted this from the Sal catalogue, uh, which is in the Essex Record Office. And again, it's just to give you a sense of the size of the estate. Um, so you, you can see there's 13 farms, plus the Bell, the Copt Hall estate owned the Bell Inn, as it was then and the houses around it. 
Uh, and you can see that in total, uh, it, uh, it's 13 farms. Uh, it comes to, what is it, 2,600 acres. Um, and I've also added onto this the number of people that were being employed by the tenants of the farms in the 1871 census. Uh, and you can see that it comes to, it's about 55 men and 15 boys. And then you have to add on to that the people who I'm calling those who are subcontracted. So the estate was a, was, a, was a big piece, it was a big piece of land, it was a big piece of economic activity with huge impact on the local economy. So what I want to do now is actually look at some of the properties, well three of the properties and some of the people who who, who were associated with it, to see what we can find out about them using the sources that I've mentioned. And I want to start with Wintry Park Farmhouse. I'm just going to take a sip of water. So this is um, a reasonably recent photo of Wintry Park Farmhouse. It's a grade two listed building. Um, it's just um, to the north of Epim. Um, it's off of Thornwood Road, if, if you know that part of Epin at all. Um, so at the time of the sale, the 1869 sale, the tenant of Wintry Park was a man called William Symes. And he was born in 1834 in Barwick, Somerset. His parents were Edward Symes and Elizabeth Page. In the 1841 census, the Symes family is in Barwick, Somerset, and Edward Symes is described as a farmer. But by 1851, they are farming at Wintry Park, and Edward is described as employing 12 labourers. Edward, the father, died on the 7th of September 1867, when he was killed by a bull on his farm. Indeed, he was gored to death. On the 12th of December, 1883, William, the son, married Jane Scarlett at St George's Church, Hanover Square. He was about 50, she was about 33. And on the marriage certificate, Jane's father is shown as a butcher. So the marriage may reflect an existing commercial link between the two. They do not appear to have had any children and Jane died about January 1909. William lived for another seven years and he died on the 1st of January 1916 at Wintry Farm itself and he was buried at All Saints Church, Epping Upland. His estate was valued at a probate of £4,400 in um, 1916. £4,400 in 1916 equates to about £480,000 now. So he did very well from his tenant farming. How does Symes appear in the local press, I hear you ask? Well, I'm going to answer that question. It's mainly bringing prosecutions against poachers and trespassers. Uh, this is an example. This is from the Essex Times for Saturday, the 6th of December, 1868. And you can see it concerns a George Stannard and a William Perry, who are uh, accused of stealing oats. Uh, and I'll um, read it, a bit of it out in case you can't re read it. So it says, George Stannard, 33, labourer, and William Perry, labourer, on bail, were indicted for stealing eight bushels of oats, the property of William Symes, their master, at Epping. Mr. Croom prosecuted. It appeared that prisoners were stopped by Mr. Symes while going from the granary with the oats in their possession. They stated they took the oats for their master's horses, but it seemed they were going in the direction away from the stables and towards their own houses. The jury found the prisoners guilty and a prior sum summary conviction was proved against Stannard of taking oats to give his master's horses. And they were sentenced to six months hard labour. 
Now, it is the case in uh, 1867, the year before, George Stannard had also uh, had appeared in the papers again in the Essex Herald in April 1867, where he was charged by his then master, George Brown of Northwell Bassett, for having basically done the same thing. He stole three <coughs> bushels of oats then and claimed he was going to take them uh, to feed to his master's horses. Um, so, what can we say about these two men, George Stannard and William Perry? Well, William Perry was probably born about 1844 in Epping. And if so, in the 1861 census, he's living in Woodbine Cottage, the Plain, Epping, and he's an agricultural labourer. In the 1871 and the 1881 census, he's living on Sewardston Street, and he's working in the gunpowder mills. So he didn't go back to agricultural labouring after his hard labour. George Stannard, the other person, is probably born about 1835 in Suffolk. And if so, in the 1861 census, he's a horsekeeper at Pinch Timber Farm. Pinch Timber Farm is another one of the farms on the Cox Hall estate. So both survived their brush with hard labour. And for Stannard, it doesn't actually seem to have damaged his chances of employment. As in 1873, it was reported that he had won first prize in a ploughing competition on the Cox Hall estate. So this is the, the Chelmsford Chronicle for Friday the 20th of June 1873. And you will see that 21 men from the Cox Hall estate competed uh, to win three prizes. A pound was the first prize, 15 shillings the second prize, 10 shillings the third prize. And the prizes were given by Mr. Wright, who is the Lord of the Manor, who is the owner of Cocktail, who is the owner of the Cocktail estate. And you can see that the first prize went to Stannard, who is a ploughman to Mr. G. Crane at Pinch Timber Farm, almost certainly the Stannard I was talking about in the earlier newspaper cutting. So his convictions don't seem to have as, as I say, impacted on his ability um, to find work. I want to turn briefly now to another property and the people associated with that. Um, and this is um, Ravenous Farm, which is the other end of the Cox Hall estate. Um, I'm afraid I can't find a photo of Ravenous Farmhouse, but it is also a grade two listed building. Um, so this is down on Cocktail Green, if you know the area at all. So um, in the 1869 Sow catalogue, in the 1871 census, Ravenous is in the tenancy of Lydia Carter, whose uh, who's, um, maiden name was Baker. Uh, and she was born about 1813 in Combaton, Cambridgeshire. She married William Carter in 1832 in Combaton. He was a tenant farmer in Royston in the 1861 census, but when he died in 1866, it is at Raven's Farm, which in actual fact is Ravener's Farm. His widow took over the tenancy and held it until she died in May 1893. Indeed, good for her. Her administration was for a much smaller sum, though, than William Symes, just £45 which equates to about £7,000 in current values. So she was operating a smaller farm and probably wasn't able to generate as much profit. Lydia appears a few times in the local press. Here's one. This is from the Essex Newsman of the 20th of November, 1875. And again, I'll read it out just in case you can't see it. So it says, Henry Ellis of Cocktail Green was charged by Josephine Green with trespassing in search of game on land in the occupation of Lydia Carter. This being his second offence for game trespass, he was fined 10 shillings and costs nine shillings or in default, 14 days hard labour. This Henry Ellis, is probably Henry, uh, Henry 
Ellis, who in the 1871 census is residing at Park Farm at Coptal Green. And if so, and this is surprising, he is the son of a John Ellis, who is the tenant of Park Farm. Park Farm was 93 acres and employing one. So if that's the case, why is he trespassing on a nearby farm in order to steal? We'll never know, but it, it would appear that that is the case. Um, Lydia was also uh, the object of uh, the long arm of the law. Um, this is from the Chelmsford Chronicle, September 1882 where uh, she is summoned for not paying her rates. Perhaps some things never change. Um, uh, so she is basically appealing because she says, um, I had my rates reduced, and so why am I having to pay the full amount? And you can see the amount is around three shillings and one and a half penny. Uh, the vestry clerk points out that the, the reduction was actually for the land and not for the house uh, and uh, the magistrates decided they agreed with that version of events and she did actually have to pay the amount. Now Lydia and William had a number of children and one of them whose name was Thomas is described in the 1871 census as the farm manager at Ravenna's farm and in the 1891 census he's described as the farm bailiff by 1901, however, he's described as an, quote, ordinary agricultural labourer who is living on Crown Hill Coptal Green. Who the son Thomas worked for is not shown in the census return. It hardly is this early in the census returns. It is for the later ones. So he's initially described as the farm manager and then the farm bailiff but now he is described as just an ordinary agricultural laborer as the tenancy of ravenous farm had actually passed to somebody else a man by the name of william best by the 1901 census it's possible that he was actually an agricultural laborer on the farm he used to manage um, so it's this, if so, this is a story of the decline of the economic fortunes of a family. William Bestall, the guy who's now the tenant, uh, seems to have made a great success of his tenancy of Raveners. He's still farming it in 1937, according to the Kelly's directory of that year. He died on the 8th of February 1938 at 7, the shrubberies, George Lane, South Woodford which some of you may know it's on the left as you go down George Lane and he left an estate which was valued at 46,000 pounds in contemporary terms so he seems to have made a great success of his farming I'm going to move on to one more property uh, which is the bell uh, which some of you may know it's now a hotel um, that's what the bell looked like in about 1900. Um, so I want to talk about the Bell Inn and the Parish family. Uh, the name is sometimes spelt with one R and sometimes spelt with two. Now the Parish family have a long connection with Epping and the Cockpool Estate, and indeed there are still parishes who live in Epping. I want to start with Gilbert. He was born in 1726 and, 17, and died in 1779. And Gilbert gives a masterclass in how to ingratiate yourself because he named his sixth child George Conyers Cockthall Parish. <laughs> it's a true story. I'm not making any of this up. Uh, George Conyers Cockthall Parish. Parish. It actually didn't work because this George didn't actually work on the Coptall estate. He did become a farmer, and I haven't established where, but it wasn't on, on the Coptall um, estate. One of Gilbert's other chill children, whose name was Edward, did almost as well on the name in front when he called one of his children George Conyers Parish. Third son of Gilbert, 
was John. John had a child also called John. I hope you're following this. <laughs> this John was a bricklayer. So, and, and bricklaying becomes the occupation that runs in the parish family. And I think in the uh, early part of the 20th century, they went into house building. So John, John, who's a bricklayer, he married a Sarah, a Sarah Nichols from Nazin, and they had nine children. And their second child was called George, and he lived from 1831 to 1894. Now, George seems to have made a great success of the family occupation of bricklayer. At first, he was working in Epping, and then by 1855, he was working in the Barbican area of London. But by 1861, he's back in Epping, and he's the publican of the Bell Inn. His occupation shifts between bricklayer and publican over the following census returns, but he, he is always at the Bell Inn, so he probably followed both occupations, a not uncommon practice in the 19th century for people to have more than one job, more than one trade. He died, this George died, on the 9th of February 1894 and is also buried at All Saints in Epping Upland. And at probate, his estate was valued at £237, which is about £39,000 in contemporary terms. George's son, Albert Charles Parrish, he starts out as a bricklayer in 1891 in Upper Walthamstow, but after the death of his father, he takes over as landlord of the Bell Inn from 1901 onwards. Parish, parish members also had brushes with the law. Uh, this is from the Essex County Chronicle for Friday the 27th of October 1905 and again I shall read some of it out in case you can't see it yourself Charles Parrish and Harry Savile labourers of Cotswold Green were charged with trespassing in search of game on land of Thomas Nichols at Epping Upland on October the 8th Robin Taylor gamekeeper said he saw two men in a field they ran away but he caught Savile who had with him a bag containing several rabbits freshly killed, banged to rights, one might say. Savile also had with him a ferret and nets. He was certain that the other man was Parrish, and then we get a quote from the man himself. I was not there, he says. It wasn't me you saw. However, the defendants were each fined 10 shillings and costs, and it is perhaps worth pointing out that the magistrate, that saw this case was E.J. Wythes, who was uh, the owner of Coptal and the Coptal estate and um, the employer of these two men. <laughs> this, uh, okay, so um, the Charles Parish in this newspaper clipping is probably a nephew of the George Conyers Parish we saw earlier. And in the 1901 census, Charles, uh, is a bricklayer's labourer, probably working for one of his relatives. Harry Savile is probably a son of John Savile, who in 1871 is an agricultural labourer at Parvel's farm, another one of the Coptal estate farms. So he's a son, probably a son of John Savile, who is an agricultural labourer at Parvel's farm, where the Thomas Nichols who bought the trespass case was the tenant. And if so, Harry Savile is poaching very close to home. He's poaching on the farm where his father works. So, um, I'm coming to the end. I, I, I can't end without mentioning the marvelously named Isaac Rainbird. Uh, I, I, don't have a slide for Isaac, you'll be pleased to know. But I just want to, um, to use Isaac to show that people don't only appear in the local newspapers if they've, been, uh, if they've been caught up with the law. So Isaac Rainbird was born in 1805 in Hardwick in Hertfordshire, and he died in 1889 in Epping. And Isaac was an agricultural labourer at 
Berry Farm, which is another one of the Copt Hall estate farms. And in 1836, Isaac was awarded an award at the Epin Agricultural Society. And his, his award was for having worked for the same master for 10 years. And um, his award, which is described as second class first reward, was two pounds, um, which equates to 206 pounds in current values. And I like to think of Isaac feeling pleased with the fact that he had been rewarded with his loyalty to the same master for 10 years. So it's, it's not only when they have run, run ins with the law that people appear in the local newspapers. Um, so uh, as they say, my name's Alan White. Uh, thank you for listening to me. Now, um, if you're interested, I, I've created what in effect is a family tree, except it isn't a family tree because it's got hundreds of families in it, but it's got 1,800 people in it who are possibly associated with the Copt Hall estate. And it's freely available on the ancestry.co.uk website. You just need to search for a family tree called Copt Hall 2. And if you're interested, you can look at all these people that I have been looking at, trying to, to come up with a way of writing this story of the people who worked on the estate, a small glimpse of which I have given you this evening. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope I didn't throw too much information at you. And if you have any questions, I would be happy to receive them. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Alan White. Thank you. Thank you. A great talk about the people that we don't often know very much about, which you mentioned at the very beginning. Okay, do we have any questions for Dr. Alan White? Right, uh, Alan, um, you know, really comprehensive um, digest on the Coptal estate. My question is, you might want to go for a theme in order to look at who the servants and the people connected with um, Coptal were, according to, uh, at the time of the fire at Coptor and compare it possibly with the Royal Forest Hotel. As you know, they had a fire in 1912. And the second uh, reason for that is that obviously it would have caused problems to employment and even injury, et cetera, et cetera, and even to the fire services. So you might, you know, ponder on that one. Yeah, okay. That's an interesting thought. Um, I mean, a theme is what I'm looking for. Um, the, th the thing with, with going with the fire in 1917 is um, I don't know how many of the people who were, who were working at the hall had been working for the family prior to that and all, also that's the hall, it's not the estate and I did want to try and talk about the, the estate as opposed to just the hall. But, but it's a theme is what I need and so that's a great thought. Okay, any more questions? And yes, online? No, oh, you've got one. <laughs> <laughs> so I've recently read a book called, I think it's called The Housekeeper's Tale by Tessa Bowes. And she's interviewed lots of, uh, well, not interviewed, she's researched um, housekeepers of stately homes through letters and records. And, uh, and I'm just thinking some of the things that she looked at were household accounts. Mm. And I wonder if, I know you said you've got documents from the Essex Record Office, but whether any of the families who used to live there have their own archives elsewhere. I mean, it's a lot of digging, but I mean, yeah. you might find some records. I've found the things fascinating in there were the things that were purchased for the family. I mean, that sends you off on another tangent, but just yeah. an idea. So. No, 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 and it's a good idea. When I had the meeting with Alan Cox that I talked about, which was a couple of months before the COVID, um, he was telling me that they have arch that, that the Copt Hall has some of the archives of the estate, um, and he also tells me they have some transcripts of interviews with people who used to work at the hall. Now, what with one thing and another, I've never got back to him about this. But in actual, I sent him an email this afternoon because of this and said, "Oh, you mentioned that there's an archive and interviews. I'd, I'd like to come come in and have a look at them." 
Um, the stuff at the Essex Record Office is basically about the owners. Um, you know, that's, that's that's part of the thing that I said at, at the start. But I'm hoping that the, the, the stuff they have at the hall itself might, might help. Okay, anyone else? Any more questions for Alan? One more at the back. There's always a heckler at the back, isn't there? Look. Look at this, look. Good evening, Tim. Um, I was wondering if you'd looked at some of the records um, for, for, of the poor, so perhaps some um, workhouse records if um, some of these servants had ended up in the workhouse or perhaps even been employed from the workhouse, maybe uh, there would be mentions in the school system, obviously that rather depends on what the records are like for that particular poor law union, um, but maybe there are some clues, certainly the fairs that took place in Waltham Abbey turn up in the newspapers. I expect you've seen one or two of them and entertaining events like people being accidentally shot. But, uh, yeah. um, and and uh, another sort of record perhaps rather late on though might be um, relating to war and people called up or perhaps those who didn't return. Is there anyone who's on the Epping War Memorial perhaps? Yeah, those are all good thoughts. Um, I mean, uh, so the, the what for the sake of argument let's call it a family tree except it's got about 500 families in it as i say it's on the ancestry.co website it's also on find my past and they you know they have algorithms that busily search all the records uh which was part of the reason i put them there to hope that they'd be able to find me some sources um they've not come up with um a lot now one of the issues that i didn't mention at the start and perhaps i should is of course Part of the problem I've got is when it comes to, you know, who, so um, if I go back to this, so, okay, I can look at the 1871 census and I can see that at Chambers Manor, uh, the tenant was John Stanley and he employed, he says to the census enumerator, eight men and two boys. Who are those eight men and two boys? <laughs> the census doesn't show it and in those days in the census it people didn't or they were asked to say what they did but they didn't they weren't asked to say who they worked for in the 1921 census and the, and the 1911 census they did they could say who they worked for so part of the problem that i've got which is why i've got 1800 names is because I'm trying to work out actually who did work on the on the, these farms, which is why the Cops, the Cops Hall archives may help me because if they've got the accounts, that may show who the tenants were paying wages to. That, that I'm hoping that that will be the, the case. But you're right, the poor law, if the records exist, and you're quite right that they're patchy, may give some in, insight. One other thing, and then I will shut up, is what is also clear from looking at the census returns is people are moving around a lot. I mean, they're transitory, you know, people work at the hall. I mean, it's much easier to see who worked at the hall because in the census return, you've got Copt Hall and it's got Conyers or wives, and then it's got dum, 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 dum. And you can see who these people are and you can see from one 10 years to the next, it's not the same people. Um, so, you know, people are moving around all the time, um, which is another issue, you know, it's hard to find them. I'll oh, stop. Uh, I've got a question. Oh. So this is ongoing research, isn't it? It is ongoing research. And so I would suggest to you that um, over the next two or three years, you may be able to come back to us and tell us some more interesting stories. <laughs> I, I may be able to come back and tell a more coherent story. Yes. If you're asking me if I'd like to come back when I've got some more to say, I'm more than happy. That's what I wanted to hear. Thank you, everyone. Dr. Alan White. Thank you.